really excited to be here. Um, I, I've really appreciated AWI, as you guys will find. Um, I, I don't necessarily fit into the biology mold very well, so um, having an, an institute like AWI on campus has really, uh, really been beneficial for me. Um, so again, I, I'm going to introduce myself really quickly, um, talk a little bit about how I view the world, um, and then jump into some case studies, and hopefully uh, we get through all three and kind of share the exciting things my lab is up to. Um, so I'm originally from Arkansas, uh, so moving back to Alabama was actually, uh, it's kind of like coming home, really excited about it, besides, you know, rooting for the wrong football team. Uh, it's been really great to be here. Uh, my, my, my undergrad degree is actually in biosystems engineering. Um, my PhD uh, from Virginia Tech, that's what the, the Hokie is for, uh, was uh, also in biosystems engineering, but I focused on dissolved organic matter and nitrogen processing in floodplains there. Um, I went on to do a postdoc, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this work um, in the Forest Resources and Environmental uh, Conservation Department at Virginia Tech, where we focused on wetland connectivity. And specifically, uh, that work was looking at um, questions that EPA had surrounding the, uh, the 2015 WOTUS rule, which there's you know, been a lot of drama in the courts since then. Um, and then finally, um, I went on to the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center for two years to postdoc there, uh, where I focused on more mechanistic drivers of, of carbon processing in wetlands. Um, and there's actually a couple of us from Sysinc on campus now, two, two other faculty in, uh, in uh, geography. Um, so uh, this is a, a meme my PhD student made. Uh, when I don't know something, I usually in the biology department, I usually say I'm not a biologist. Uh, when I come over here and you guys ask me hard questions, uh, Greg asked me one earlier on the walkover, I usually say I'm not a hydrologist. Um, so uh, if you ever hear me say that, it's just a, it's, it's uh, maybe a cop out. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, my, my PhD student made this and so it was kind of, we thought it was funny. Um, so jumping into more of the science, um, I, and, and I'm really preaching to the choir here, but water resources management is, is one of the biggest issues of our time. Uh, everything from drinking water uh, to energy, agriculture, and what I spend most of my time thinking about ecosystem functions. Um, I uh, spent the first decade of my career focused on uh, upstream processes in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, and now I'm down here uh, working in and around the Mobile Bay. Um, so it, it's, it's actually been a really uh, nice transition. But the, the point here is um, everything we do on the landscape impacts these downstream waterways. And these waterways are really important. Um, they're both important ecologically, but also culturally. Um, and what what I want to kind of do today is merge some two, two disparate ideas, one from, uh, one from ecosystems ecology and one from catchment hydrology. And so this is the natural flow regime. Uh, Lori Poff put this together, um, I believe this was in 1998. I was still in grade school, actually. Um, and actually, Leroy and I are from the same hometown, which is kind of funny. Uh, but what he did is, and he's an ecologist, um, he focused on how flow variation, or the, what he coined the natural flow regime, how that impacted biota. So specifically how the uh, magnitude, frequency, duration, timing, and rate of change of the hydrograph um, impacted life history cycles of biota. Um, and when I talk to um, our students about the flow regime, I, I kind of liken it to a band, right? Um, if I, I, I like the white stripes, and uh, you know they have this, these great bass lines, but their songs wouldn't be their songs without the entire band. And so when we talk about how hydrologic variation impacts ecosystems, we, we often focus on one, uh, one particular uh, uh, metric. For example, I was trained in engineering, so we think a lot about maximum flood extent, right? Um, but there's a lot more to the flow regime than just that maximum flood extent. And um, the flow regime concept, it's really uh, grown into eFlow science or environmental flows. Um, we don't necessarily do a lot of that here in the southeast, um, but uh, this is really important for folks out west, um, and in particular, uh, managing uh, dams. This is the Glen Canyon Dam. Um, and essentially, the idea here is how can we manage uh, these large reservoirs and the, the outflows of these reservoirs uh, to produce a more natural flow regime? And uh, this, I just kind of, I, I, I googled natural flow regime, Glen Canyon Dam, and this was the first paper that popped up. But there's, there's a ton of management strategies that, that can be used to manage uh, that flow much better. And the great thing about a dam, I mean, from an ecosystem perspective, dams aren't always great. But the great thing is, is it's a valve, right? 
we can control what's coming in and out of that of out of the reservoir to some degree at least. But uh, what I want to think about, and what I hope to think about um, moving forward, is what about the other components, the other places that we can start to that, that impact the flow regime. So spatially, um, what what about changes in land use are changing our flow regime? Um, I spend a lot of time in floodplains and thinking about the trees in the floodplains. So there's also uh, thinking about uh, you know larger than just the river corridor itself. Um, and so the second concept that I think is really important, and for those of you who have spent much time in the catchment literature, you've probably heard of the variable source area concept. Um, it's developed in Coweta, and it basically talks about the expansion and contraction of the river network. Um, and this was uh, put together by Hewlett and Hibbert in, in the 60s. Um, and uh, it's kind of funny. I don't know if we've actually gone much in, in catchment hydrology. I don't know if we've pushed much beyond uh, this, uh, this original conceptualization. But one thing that's often overlooked when we think about Hewlett and Hibbert is the, um, the hierarchy of drivers of uh, hydrologic variability. So specifically thinking about clim climatic drivers, um, physiographic drivers, and then when we get down to the local level, uh, storage and connectivity, or how your watershed is plumbed. And uh, if you're a biologist, um, you're probably thinking, gee, this looks a lot like um, environmental filtering. And it is. It, it, it actually, uh, this is very, very equivalent to the environmental filtering concept. Um, and so I'm still trying to think about what that means, specifically from a management standpoint. Um, so the fundamental questions that drive uh, my lab's work is can we develop predictive relationships between drivers of hydrologic variability and downstream function? Um, and then how do we use this information to better manage ecosystems? Because I can go collect all the data in the world, have a ton of fun doing it. You've probably seen me on Twitter. We spend a lot of time in the field. Uh, but if we're not collecting data uh, that's useful, then we're wasting time uh, and we don't want to do that. So uh, to jump into these case studies, the first I'm going to jump into is uh, headwater wetlands. And I, all my work happens, or the vast majority of my work happens on big teams. Um, so this, this, was, uh, this started as uh, my, my, my postdoc, my first uh, gig outside of my PhD with the Powell Center group. So I was actually a postdoc for that Powell Center group. Um, that's up here. You can't see behind us is the world's largest buffalo, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and then uh, later on, the, uh, I, I would go on and work with Margaret Palmer's team. Uh, she's a restoration ecologist. Um, and then this is, uh, if you're on Twitter, this is the Delmarva Disco team. And so that's a, that's a team that's kind of an outgrowth of both of these. Um, and we actually just finished up our, or we're about to finish up our NSF grant that funded that work. Um, so why do we care about uh, wetlands? Well, like I said, I'm from Arkansas. Ducks are an incredibly important part of our culture in Arkansas, and specifically duck hunting. Um, if you care about biodiversity, wetlands are hotspots for biodiversity, an incredible biodiversity resor resource here in the southeast, and, and specifically in South Alabama. Uh, this is a flatwood reticulated salamander. Um, wetlands are by far some of the best uh, best management practices, if we can restore wetlands, they're the best things we can do in agricultural settings to re reduce nutrients, which in turn often will reduce algal blooms. And finally, for those of us who think a lot about carbon, wetlands are often large sinks of carbon, um, and, and that's important for global change. Um, but we've had, uh, there's really been pervasive wetland loss um, throughout the country. Um, so this is, this is the change in wetlands. Um, I believe it's since 1950 um, to 2010. I, I think that's right. But regardless, um, we've lost a ton of, we, we've seen a huge change in our wetlands. Here in Alabama, we've lost about half of our wetlands. Uh, when I was in Maryland before this, it was, uh, you know, uh, three quarters of our wetlands, about 75%. And then, in, you know, if you look over at California, uh, they've lost 90% of their wetlands. So these are incredibly important places um, that we continue to lose. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's a lot that drives a lot of the motivation behind this work to better understand them. And so how do inundation regimes uh, vary across head, headwater wetland types? That's the first question we're going to ask. So to do this, we picked uh, three archetypal wetlands. Uh, first, the prairie potholes. Um, so these are, these are depressional wetlands that are found in North Dakota and South Dakota. Uh, Delmarva Bay wetlands. Um, so we, we have... Uh, we have these depressional wetlands along the eastern seaboard. They're often called Carolina Bays. Where I was working, we called them Delmarva Bays because we're on the Delmarva Peninsula. 
And then finally, um, Cypress Domes in South Florida. If you've never been to a Cypress Dome, they're one of the coolest places ever. I kind of feel like I'm like in a Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, but to, to look at uh, to look at how you know, how these wetlands function differently, uh, we developed a really simple uh, uh, small catchment model called the Wetland Hydrologic Capacitance Model, and it's really just a bucket model uh, for. For the modelers in the room, this is a conceptually based model. Uh, we, we use uh, really simple equations to route water into different buckets. It's, uh, it, it, it initially was run in Excel, so it's not, it's not very complex. Um, but um, what we did with that is we, we picked a, a Huck 8 watershed from each of these regions, and we used publicly available data sets from each of those regions to parameterize those models. And so what I'm going to show you here is um, each one of these lines represents one wetland, um, and it represents the mean water level from one year, or from across a thousand years of simulation. So the line, normally when you look at wetland water level, there's a lot more variation in the lines, and these are relatively smooth. So the point here is we're looking at the timing of um, we're, we're looking at the timing of the changes in water level across these wetlands. And what you see in the Prairie Pothole region is you see you know, and this isn't actually that, that, it's not necessarily that exciting. You see that the, uh, you have this snowmelt peak, uh, or you have this peak in, in water level after snowmelt. In Delmarva in South Florida, we don't necessarily have a, a, a normal peak, but we do have a regular drawdown where these wetlands go dry. Uh, in South Florida, it occurs much earlier in the summer, um, and then in Delmarva, it occurs later in the fall. Um, and the, the wetlands we have here in Alabama are somewhere in between those two. And so the timing of that dry down is actually incredibly important for both life histories and carbon cycling. Um, and because I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to keep going. I, I would love to talk about that modeling more uh, because I, I know it's relevant to a lot of stuff that folks are doing on campus. Um, we also, uh, modeling to me is really, uh, it's an informed hypothesis. And really, uh, th the way forward to understanding hydrologic and biogeochemical processes is empirical data. Um, so when we, we really drove in here um, to the local scale to look at uh, potential drivers of wetland inundation regimes. And so to do this, uh, we instrumented six catchments. Um, when I say catchments, most of the folks in the room probably are thinking, you know, thousands of hectares. Uh, these are each 10 hectares. They're real small. Um, and, um, but the, each, one of, each one of these six catchments, um, they are dominated by wetlands and uh, these depressional wetlands that expand and contract. And these are um, particularly important to folks at the EPA because they didn't know how to classify them in 2015 when the new uh, Waters of the US rule came out. They didn't know if they were federally um, protected or not. Um, Currently, they're not. Uh, but the, uh, part, of, part of what we were doing was trying to, to quantify um, the, the amount of water that moves from these wetlands to downstream. We we're also, for the state of Maryland, trying to quantify methane emissions as well. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so our instrumentation, uh, we had uh, essentially kind of looked like a porcupine. We, we had tons of wells out across these, these catchments um, where we were measuring uh, both water level um, and then things uh, like dissolved organic carbon and nitrogen as well. Um, this is one of the smaller wetlands. And the point I wanted to make here is that when folks think about wetlands, they often think about places with, um, with, with uh, a lot of inundation and a lot of uh, um, emergent vegetations. Uh, these, these areas uh, largely didn't have a ton of emergent vegetation. Um, and so some folks, especially in the Northeast, might actually call them um, vernal pools. Uh, the other thing here, and th this will be really important at the end, is these are small. We, we instrumented small wetlands. Um, and uh, those are, are, are really the hardest to, to both see from space with remote sensing data, then also the hardest to predict from a hydrologic standpoint as well. Um, so we had roughly 24 wetlands um, instrumented, and they all fell within this gray band. This is the water level in the middle of the wetland. Um, so they, they had these, this general seasonal pattern, um, but there was variability across. And what we did is we utilized that variability across the wetlands to look at drivers of the differences. Um, and one thing that's really important here is if um, a lot of the work we're doing is looking at the impacts of, down, of these wetlands on downstream waterways. Basically, from the middle of January 
through most years in May, these wetlands are, are, are bleeding into downstream waterways, directly into ditches that then uh, feed perennial rivers. Um, and so for the, um, the next three slides or so, we're gonna look at how topographic variables drive some of this uh, variation. And so the first one, uh, we looked at uh, depth to confining layer. So essentially, uh, we used the elevation of the wetland and that told us something about how, how much access it had, the, the wetland had to the superficial aquifer. And what we saw is that um, the, the mean water level, um, as you increased elevation, the mean water level of that wetland decreased, right? So uh, that, the idea there is that the, as wetlands have access to, the, uh, to, to that the superficial aquifer, um, that's important and it plays a role in how much water actually stays in the wetland. We also see that wetland size is a really important predictor of, uh, of that variation. And so the important point about this slide is these two wetlands are adjacent to each other. Um, you can't tell, but this wetland up here is our largest wetland. Um, I think it was five hectares. Um, this is our smallest wetland. We actually named it after me because I was the smallest person on the team. Um, I'm short. But in, anyway, uh, they're right adjacent and they're at the same elevation. And so they make for a really good comparison what you see is that the, the smaller wetland has much more dynamic water level. The, the larger wetland has a much more stable water level. And so the idea here is wetland size matters. And so when we look across our 20 some odd wetlands, we do see that as you increase wetland area, um, you decrease wetland variance. Um, and again, this is quite problematic. If you want to predict wetland extent, these smallest wetlands are they're, they're quite important for biogeochemical cycling, especially methane production. And so they're the hardest to see and they're the hardest to predict because of this variability. Um, and then finally, uh, we looked at storage capacity. Um, and uh, I don't have time to walk through this, but I spent two years developing a topographic um, or a topographic analysis so we could actually um, delineate the watersheds to these wetlands because in a, in a depressional landscape where you have fill and spill and merging, it's very difficult to actually define a, a surface watershed. And uh, the surface watersheds, um, oftentimes they, they don't contain the water like you normally. And then from a subsurface perspective, it doesn't work at all. Um, but uh, we did develop these metrics and we actually uh, looked at this, this idea of storage capacity or how much how much water could a given wetlands watershed hold? And we found that with this rough estimate that we did see some correlations between that storage capacity and the, the, the recession rate of the uh, drawdown. Okay, so um, I'm probably one of two people on campus who care about those things. Uh, but the rest of you guys care about what wetlands do, or, or hopefully you do. Um, I'm, I'm maybe projecting a little bit, but Regardless, a lot more people care about, well, what, does these, what do these changes in water level actually do? And so uh, my team was focused on methane emissions. And specifically, uh, this uh, PhD student, Kelly Hondula, we worked closely together. Um, and she was working along a, a gradient from the wetland to the upland. And she measured uh, methane about every two weeks along that gradient. Um, and just like most other folks in the literature, uh, we don't really know why. We, we don't have a really good understanding of the drivers of methane emissions. However, the only time that we saw marketable methane production, so above zero, was when the water level, when we had inundation. Um, and so Kelly did some really interesting remote sensing work to scale up those, the, the inundation and the methane production. Um, and she did this at the watershed scale. And so she used these uh, little cube satellites um, Oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the company. It's a private company. Um, and it, anyway, they, they have high temporal resolution, high spatial and temporal resolution data from these CubeSats. Um, Planet data, that's, that, that's the name. I actually have, have their socks on. They gave out socks last year at AGU. Um, anyway, Planet data, we use their data to, to see these wetlands. And the thing that's important here is seeing through the trees is really difficult. So you have these really small wetlands and you're, you're looking through the trees uh, to see them. And, and it, it's just, it's difficult. And so she had a deep learning approach. And so uh, we use wetland water level to, to estimate inundation extent. And then this is what her model produced at our six training sites. And what you'll notice 
is the model didn't do really good in the shoulder season. Uh, once leaf out happened, uh, you really just can't see the wetlands. And so that's definitely a place for innovation uh, and continued innovation and potentially using other, um, other new uh, remote sensing products that are coming online. But regardless, and the point that, I've, that we really wanted to make is that she took her wetlands, or the wetlands that we were able to capture, and she, um, she, she bend them by size. And what we did is we looked at what the methane emissions produced by each size class. Um, and she did this both looking at a time series and static area. And there's, there's important ramifications for that uh, from an earth system modeling perspective. But what I want you guys to take away, these smallest wetlands produce way more methane. Um, and uh, you know, other studies have shown this, but this is, this is by far the, the most important thing that, that came out of, uh, of our group's work so far, is just that how, how much methane these really small wetlands produce. Um, and so you may ask, okay, great, Nate, y'all went out, y'all measured all this stuff, maybe we can put it into a model, but how do we actually manage this? Well, in the Delmarva Peninsula, um, we're, we're, we're actually doing a lot of wetland restoration, and uh, there's different series of ditches that have gone in, everything from colonial ditches to ditches put in by the CCC to control malaria, and most recently, agricultural ditches. And the way they do wetland restoration, or at least the first step, is they, uh, they dam the ditch. Like, you just plug the ditch. And um, that changes the inundation regime pretty drastically, right? You go from no inundation to having a wetland uh, very quickly. Um, and whether that wetland is functioning or not is another question, um, but that's, that is what the current grant we're working on, and we ha I'm working with three really killer students at Virginia Tech, and I don't want to take anything away from their dissertation topics, but um, they, they all have papers coming out in the next couple months, uh, so something to, to keep an eye out on. Um, so let's jump into non-perennial streams. Um, so what is a non-perennial stream? It's kind of a funny term. Uh, the way our group talks about these is essentially any river uh, or, or, or stream that goes dry on a regular basis is, is non-perennial. Um, and I'm working with two really awesome groups, the Dry Rivers RCN group, that's the group on the left. Um, it's a synthesis team that includes both hydrologists and ecologists. Um, in that group, I wear the hydrologist hat. Um, and then I'm also working with the Ames team, which is an NSF EBSCOR funded um, project. Um, it's it's uh, the primary institution is Kansas, um, but we're we're one of, here at Alabama. Um, we have a, a spoke and hub model, and Alabama is actually one of the three hubs for the, the team. Um, and I'll, I'll get more to that in a second. But the thing that's really important here, and the thing that I actually didn't understand until I started working on these projects a couple years ago, is the majority of our stream miles actually go dry. So globally, something like 60% of our stream miles go dry on a regular basis. But the vast majority of our studies of, of, of streams have been in perennial reaches. So um, there's this huge data gap um, in, in these areas. Um, and even here in Alabama, roughly, so. Alabama is the wettest place I've lived. Maybe you guys have lived in wetter places. But even here in Alabama, 40% of our map stream network goes dry. And depending on how you define the stream network, it's probably a lot more. Um, and this, this drying has implications for ecosystem function. Um, when you talk to ecologists, oftentimes they talk about how drying is, you know, the increased drying due to anthropogenic um, climate change is, is potentially bad. Uh, but they also, there's also, Drying plays an important role in carbon processing um, and also partitioning uh, uh, species distribution and that sort of thing as well. Um, we actually recently, in a, in a paper uh, that, that AWI actually wrote a really nice uh, um, a, a piece for us, um, it, we, we quantified the, uh, the gap in the, the, USG, or the, the gauges across, across the globe. And he, even here in the US, uh, we really just have this huge gap in knowledge of uh, the hydrologic variability in these systems. Um, here in Alabama, um, depending on how you count it, we either have zero or three gauges out of our 200-ish USGS gauges that are on stretches of, or reaches a stream that go dry. So uh, this group, we asked this question, how do non-perennial flow regimes vary across regions? Uh, we answered this. Um, we, we developed a, uh, a, a database of about 100, 540 gauges, and um, we looked at the variation both at the annual scale and the uh, event scale. And so here we're looking at, at 
across the annual scale. And the important thing, the thing that you're going to want to pay attention to is the black line. So that's the no flow fraction or the percent of gauges that were dry. And you can kind of start to see some, uh, some seasonal variability there. Um, what's, I, I think, the, the most striking is looking at Mediterranean California. I have a, a colleague I work with closely out there versus here in the East Coast, we have less, less gauges that go dry and they, they occur much later in the season. Um, so John Hammond, who's a scientist at the USGS, he took this and he started to look at drivers of, of that drying across, across uh, space, right? And so um, he found um, you know, spatial coherence or spatial patterns um, were pretty common in these. So physiography is a big driver of the timing of drying. And then Sam Zipper from KU, um, who I work really closely with on the EBSCOR project, um, he used that same database and looked at how these, how these annual metrics are changing over time. And the, the big thing that's important here, the thing that everyone in this room should take away, is here in the southeast, stream drying is increasing. So this isn't, this isn't not only do we have a lot of streams that go dry, but the, the occurrence of this drying is occurring more. And then finally, Adam Price, um, who's a recent PhD grad, or he's actually defending uh, tomorrow, actually, or not tomorrow, on Monday. Um, he, he did an analysis where uh, he looked at the drying regime, or essentially looked at variation at the event scale. So these previous metrics, or these previous analyses, we were, we were thinking at the annual scale. But here he was looking at a single hydrograph. Uh, and really, from this database, he pulled roughly 25,000 hydrographs. Um, and then he did a random forest analysis. And the thing that's really interesting here is before we were thinking, you know, things like climate and um, and land or yeah, climate and and, and location were important uh, predictors um, for the the drying metrics. Here we actually see that land use is an important driver of, of the metrics. And at this scale, it's difficult to actually think about what that means, um, right? You, it, it's hard to say. Well, grassland is causes this sort of, uh, of, of drying uh, behavior. But what it did indicate is potentially uh, some of the, the internal plumbing of, of your watersheds is actually driving that drying behavior. And so uh, from that work, uh, that's, that's the, this Ames project grew out of that. And we're actually asking, what are drivers of those non-perennial streams? And we're thinking at the local scale. And what, how do they impact downstream water quality? Um, so there's 18 PIs across eight institutions. If you think that sounds like a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you're absolutely right. Um, but it's also a lot of fun. Um, we have folks across hydrology, biogeochemistry, uh, folks, uh, ecologists thinking about macroinvertebrates. And then also um, one of the more exciting aspects of the project, we have uh, microbiologists thinking about microbiomes and, and how microbiomes change across both regions and also across drying regimes. Um, and so these are our nine field sites. So we have, we have three field sites here in Alabama. Uh, we have three field sites in the Midwest. That's another hub. And then three field sites in Idaho. So these are all EBSCOR states. And each one of these research watersheds, we have a ton of instrumentation. At the watershed outlet, we have uh, a nest of, of, of sensors uh, that include everything from d dissolved oxygen, nitrate, um, uh, yeah, just the, the whole suite of anything you can imagine to measure, we're, we're likely measuring it. And then throughout the watershed, we also have pressure transducers and then a binary water level loggers. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm advertising this is as we're collecting this data, we're actually publishing it, right? And so it, it, part of the, the project is developing an open source database of, of this information. And so we want people to work with us and tell us what this data means. Um, and it'd be even better if it was folks from the University of Alabama. Um, at an Ames adjacent site, I wanted to talk briefly about what my PhD student Delaney Peter Peterson is doing. Um, we're actually using a lot of the same concepts that, that we're developing in Ames. We're looking at how um, we're, we're looking at drivers of surface water, groundwater connectivity, and specifically Delaney's um, delineated this into vertical connectivity, horizontal connectivity, and longitudinal connectivity. And uh, one of the really interesting things, and you've probably noticed this driving around out Western Alabama, but we see incision is a huge or is an important driver of the patterns of uh, the flow regime and drying. And so uh, specifically, we see these gullies and that Tanglewood. So this is all work being done at Tanglewood Biological Station, uh, which I might add, AWI funded quite a bit of this. So thank you guys. Um, but the 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 
the, the gully formations are often two to three meters deep. And so that, that it's sort of like a ditch in an, an agricultural area. You know, every farm kid knows you dig a ditch to, to make your field go dry. Uh, this is, we're drying out our floodplains. Um, and so we're thinking a lot about what's driving this gully formation um, and specifically what it means for the riparian zone. Um, and so Delaney's got these hill slope wells, and so this is, uh, this is actual data where she's uh, got the, the, the annual average water level. And the really important part here is that you see that in the gully, um, the, and, and this holds through, uh, throughout the year, that the, the hill slope and the riparian area are a source of water to the stream. But when you go to an area where you have typical bed and banks or even a, a wetland area, um, the, the stream is actually a source often to the, to the riparian zone. Um, so there's bi-directional lateral flow occurring. Um, and Alan Plattner, who's not here right now, he did some uh, geophysics with us, and I, I see some geologists in the room. Um, so we're working on what this still means, but one of the things that we see is we see a distinct signature at the toe slope. Um, and what we think is happening is we think that we're, with some other anecdotal data, we think that we're picking up um, iron-rich water from the surficial aquifer that's upwelling there. And the reason why all this is important is because, uh, so Corian uh, Tataru, who is a postdoc in Bezad Mordozavi's lab, we wrote a DOE grant that actually we're finally allowed to talk about it, just got funded uh, to study um, the interactions between these small streams and the really cool wetlands we have at Tanglewood. Um, so more, more to come on that soon. Um, and I think to give the, the second speaker time, I think I'm going to go ahead and skip my, my, my thoughts on floodplains, although I would love to talk to you guys about floodplains more. Um, and so what I do want to talk about and the way I want to finish is we have this hierarchical drivers of hydrologic variability. And of course, uh, just like anything else in science, it's, it's not one, unidirectional. We have bidirectional uh, flows between these, the, this hierarchy, right? And what, I, what I've been thinking a lot about is what... What are the different intervention opportunities and, and management opportunities we have uh, to, to change the variability and you know, the hydrologic variability? Um, one thing that um, I've been working with Westervelt thinking about uh, stream restoration, which is at the reach scale. And while that often fixes um, you know, geomorph ge yeah, geomorphic problems at the reach scale, I, it, it's hard to say that that's going, you know, the stream restoration is going to necessarily impact downstream water quality at a much larger scale. Um, so thinking about the appropriate um, scale of implementation of these management um, plans or something that, that, that my group has been thinking a little bit about and um, hopefully can, we can put into a discussion later today. And with that, thank you for your time.